You love Jesus? Amen. Come on, give him a praise, somebody. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And David says over in Psalms 34, verse 8, David says, Oh, taste and see <laughs> that the Lord is good. How I many know that God is good this morning? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. To taste something means you had to experience it. There's times when my wife would try to give me something to taste. She'd say, here, taste this, try this. And I'll say, no, no, I don't like it. And she'll say, how do you know you don't like it? You haven't even tasted it. The point is, you don't know what you do or don't like until you experience it. That's what David was saying, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, experience God. One encounter with God, one experience with God, and you will see that he's good. How many know that he's good this morning? This morning, I just want to take a few moments just to talk with you about your relationship with God and how it's time to know God for yourself, to have that personal relationship with God. How many know that God wants to be your friend? First Corinthians chapter one, verse nine, the text says, God is faithful by whom you were called onto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now the word unto also means into. And the word fellowship in this verse means communion with or companion with or association with. And all these words are synonymous. The only difference is the degree of intimacy that is expressed. So I'm going to read you the same verse of the Amplified. It reads like this. God is faithful, reliable, trustworthy, and therefore ever true to his promise. And he can be depended on. By him you are called into companionship and participation with his son. Jesus Christ, our Lord. How I many know that God created us for intimacy? He created us for fellowship. He created us for relationship. It's important to understand that God did not have to create us. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God did not have to create us. He created us for relationship. He created us for intimacy. After he had created everything else, he said it was good. God said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, he said, it takes us, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him, male and female created he them. God created us for relationship. He didn't have to create us. He created everything else. And then he created man. And he created us for one reason. To fellowship with us. To have intimacy with us. Romans chapter 5 verse 10 and verse 11 the text says, for since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Verse 11, the text says, so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. That's a New Living Translation. Just turn to your neighbor and say, hi, friend of God. 
Imagine that being a friend of God. God sees us as his friend. In John 15, verse 15, Jesus says, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Now when you study this word out, friend in the Greek, it means a deep, close, intimate comrade. I mean, know that God wants to be your comrade. He wants to be your friend. And the Bible makes it very clear, crystal clear, that God wants to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us. So oftentimes it's easy to look at the structure of the church and look at um, the, 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 the trimmings of, of, of religion and forget the fact that we truly serve a, an amazing, living, awesome, incredible, Life God. And he wants to have relationship with us. Turn over to Revelation chapter 3. I can remember being a babe in Christ. And I can remember looking at um, the older saints and how they prayed and how they would share their testimonies and when you get around they'll be like God said and well, God, God showed me this I'm thinking man God you ain't said nothing to me you ain't showed me nothing I can't pray like that man I can't wait to be like that I can't wait I can't wait but I can remember the first time the Lord spoke to me and ministered to my heart and I knew that I knew that I knew that it was God ministering to me and talking to me. And it was a life-changing experience because I just could not believe that God would take the time to talk to me. Because see, in my mind, I wasn't as spiritual as some of these other people. I was not were verse in the Bible like some of these other people. I didn't pray like some of those other people. I definitely was not as disciplined as some of those other people. I had issues unlike some of those other people. And I could not believe that with all my failures and all of my frailties that God would minister to me. But he let me know. He let me know. He said, you draw nigh to me. And I'll draw nigh to you. And we see, I, I was under the assumption that I had to be a perfect person. I had to do everything right. I had to cross my T's and dot my I's. I had to get everything right for God to take the time out for me. And God let me know. He said, no. You come as you are. You draw nigh to me. I draw nigh to you. And the more I got closer to God, the more I wanted to be like God, the more I wanted not to do the things I was doing. And what he was saying was, as you draw close to me, I'll do the rest. And the more I pressed in, the more those other things I was doing were pressing out. Come on, somebody. But over in the book of Revelation, God makes it clear that he wants to have a personal relationship with us. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, this is Jesus. He says, unto the angels of the church of Laodiceans write, these things said, amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, 
that there are neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot, so that because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Jesus talking to the church, and he says, I know you. I know your works. And he says, I have a concern for my church. I have a concern for my people. He says, my concern here with you is that you're lukewarm. Lukewarm means to be complacent. It means to be unconcerned. It means to be inactive or idle. He says, I know thy works. He says, but you're lukewarm. And he says, in essence, the reason you're lukewarm is because you're mixed. You mix with cold and you're mixed with hot. In other words, the world uh, is a part of you and the church is a part of you. And because you have both the church going on and the world going on, he says, you have become complacent. You're lukewarm. He says in verse 17, he says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And know it not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And Jesus was saying, in essence, you're saying that you're okay. But you're not okay. He says, and the worst part of it is, you don't even understand your condition. That's the worst part of it. You're saying that because you have these outward things going on, that you're okay. He says, but the problem that you're having is that you're looking at your external circumstances and trying to determine based on your external circumstances that you're good. And your external circumstances are covering up your internal situation that's going on. He says, just because you have a place to sleep, just because you have clothes to put on, just because your car is running, just because you have, you know, a meal every day. He says, that does not mean that you're okay. Now, he's talking to the church. And the point that he's making is that you're promoting external blessings at the expense of internal need, which is the sin of the 21st century church. We look at what we have in material things, we look at what we have in terms of possessions, and somehow we consider that to be blessed. Somehow we feel that if we have those things that we're okay. Jesus has said, no, you have those things, but you're not okay. And he says, that's not really the worst part of it. He says, the worst part of it is you don't recognize that you're not okay. He says, the worst part of it is you have no self-awareness of where you are spiritually. Have you ever met somebody who was messed up? No. Have you ever met somebody who was messed up? But they didn't know they was messed up? You ever met somebody who had a problem, but they did not realize they had a problem? Jesus is saying, in essence, when people are saying good things about you, and God is saying nothing about you, your life is out of order. We have a desire to know people and want people to know you and to be seen by people, but you don't have no desire for God to know you and for God to see you. He says your life is out of order. The point is this. As Christians, as believers, we have the responsibility and obligation for evaluating the spiritual condition of our lives. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you have that responsibility of knowing where you are spiritually. Jesus says in verse 19, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. 
Be jealous, therefore, and repent. Now, Jesus, he's talking to the church. He got in the face of the church, and he told the church about themselves. He didn't sugarcoat it. He told them about their spiritual condition. He says, in essence, I'm going to tell you about yourself, and I'm going to be a little hard on you, but the only reason I'm going to tell you about yourself and be a little hard on you is because I love you. He says, I love you, so I want you to repent. I love you, so I need for you to change your mind about your assessment of yourself. I don't know if you, you had ever had teenage children, uh, but I've had four, and there has been times in the raising of my, my children that I had to get in their face and tell them about themselves. I didn't take pleasure in it. It didn't give me pleasure to have to confront them. It didn't give me pleasure to get into their face and tell them about their situation because I knew it wasn't going to make them feel good. I knew that they were going to kind of, kind of flare up. But I did it because I loved them. I did it because I wanted them to change their mind about their self-assessment. I needed for them to see the reality of where they were and who they were at that moment. Because I wanted them to change for the better. See, when you know better, you can do better. And see, I, need, I needed for them to do a self-assessment because if you don't admit that you're not okay, you're not going to be okay. You had to admit that you're not okay. You had to see things for what they are, if they're going to change. And this is what Jesus was saying to the church. He says, I need for you to see the reality of who you are in this moment. Don't let external blessings cover up spiritual decay. Don't hide behind the, the, the material things and make it seem like everything is working to your good when you know internally things are not working to your good. Some of us here this morning Externally, we look good, and we drive good, and we live good, and we eat good. But internally, there's spiritual decay. Because our relationship with Christ is not where it should be. And as long as we don't confront our spiritual relationship with Christ, it won't get better. You can sing three songs and you can lift your hands and you can come to church and listen to a good little sermon, but that won't change your spiritual condition until you understand that, you know what, I need to change. Jesus says in verse 20, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now it's two important things that Jesus is saying here to the church. First he's saying I'm standing at the door of the church. He's talking to the church. He says I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking. Now if he's standing at the door of the church and he's knocking that means that they are inside the church on the other side having church without him. He's knocking at the church, at the door, trying to get in. They're having church service without God.
Do you know how many people are behind church doors this morning having service about him? And he's saying, hey, I want to come into the service. Can I come in? But we don't let him in. Because we got to have this service in 20 minutes. Or we have to do our program and keep moving. What good is a church service about a God you won't let in? Listen, what, I had to go a couple of weeks ago because my tooth was kind of giving me a little trouble because I had an old feeling that, that came out. And that old feeling came out and food was getting down in my tooth. And I was starting to feel it. You ever have a toothache? Oh, Jesus. Ain't no fun. And I called the dentist and I made an appointment. I said, we need to go ahead and we need to correct this now. Now you need to understand when I went to the dentist's office, I really didn't care what they were playing on that old TV screen in the waiting room. <laughs> I get in there and they're like, what you want to watch? I'm like, I don't, I don't really care what's on that screen. Uh, Mr. Thomas, you want some water? I, I really didn't come here for no water. <laughs> There's only one person I came here to see. Yes, sir. And I need to know that he's here. Because yeah. he's the only one that has the ability to stop my pain. Now, how many know that if I went to the dentist's office with some pain and he's not there, I'm gonna leave out the same way I came in. Sunday after Sunday, month after month, year after year, some of God's people go to God's house and lock him out. And they wonder why things are not changing because you have locked outside the door the game changer the second thing he says is this he says he comes to the house he knocks on the door he says in essence let me in. But then he says this. He says, if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. And so now he goes not only to the door of the church, but now he makes it personal. He goes to each individual and he says, in essence, if you make a decision to open the door, if you hear my voice and make that decision, I'll come and I'll sit with you. He makes it personal. He's a personal situation now, he says. And then what he's saying is, if you hear my voice and you open that door, I'll come in. First it was the church, but now it's an individual thing. And it's individual because once he gets past the church, he got to come to you as an individual. And now you as an individual have to let him in on a personal level. Because see, there are churches where he comes in and he gets in. But he still don't get to you on a personal level because now you have to hear his voice because he's in the house. You have to make it personal now. 
unless something happens on the inside of you, there's no entrance of God. Even if he's in the house, now you have to let him on the inside. Because now it's personal now. Now you have to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You have to now allow God to be Lord over your life because he's not going to force himself on you. So he can be in the house, but not in your life. Because once we allow him inside the church, now you have to allow him inside your life. Hello, somebody. And here's the thing about the guy we serve. He would never force himself on anybody. He has to be invited in. Hello, somebody. But once you invite him in, he can change your life. Amen. What's so amazing about the God that we serve is that he gives us the power of choice. Joshua chose to live for God. He said in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, he says, Choose you whom this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. David chose to serve God. David said in Psalms 84.10, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. The apostle Paul, he chose, or he chose, shall I say, to know God. He said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. So we choose to know him. We choose to fellowship with him. We choose to serve him. But we have to see the importance of being God's friend. Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, the New Living Translation. The text says, you must worship no other gods for the Lord, whose very name is Jealous is a God who is jealous about his relationship with you. How many know that we serve a God that flares up when he sees you flirting with the world? The text says his very name is jealous. He's a jealous God. Have you ever seen someone who, who was jealous? I used to have a, a friend, he was a good guy, but he was a jealous guy. And he had a little girlfriend, and man, if she looked the wrong way, or if he thought she was looking the wrong way, who are you looking at? I'm thinking to myself, man, she's just looking She did looking at the sky like everybody else. Where you been? I'm like man, she's eight o'clock in the morning. She might been asleep. <laughs> he was a jealous guy. Where are you wearing that? Well, everybody wear jeans, my friend. <laughs> he was a jealous guy. Text says God is a jealous God. Every time you flirt with the world, every time you wink at the world, every time you think about the world, God's flaring up. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, the Living Bible Translation. I love this. It says, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your love. I don't want your offerings. I want you to know me. God says, I want your sacrifices. I don't want your offerings. I want you to have a relationship with me. I want to be your friend. And I want that friendship to go past the church structure, 
to go past religion into an intimate relationship where you know me for yourself. Not just a sermon, not just someone else praying for you, but where you know God personally for yourself. God said, that's what I want. I want to know you. And I want you to know me. So the question then has to be, how do we know God better? Jesus said, if you knock, I'll come and I'll sup with you. Now you need to understand, when he says sup with you, he's not really talking about a meal. My wife and I, we had some pastor friends out for dinner. But I mean, know that we didn't need them to eat dinner. We could have ate dinner without them. It wasn't about the dinner. It was about being in fellowship with our friends. She said, I'll come and I'll sup with you. And it's not about food. It's about the koinia. It's about the fellowship. That's what he's after. So the question then has to be, how can we know God a little better? Well, the first thing has to be that he has to be a priority. We have to make him a priority. Philippians chapter 3 verse 8, New Living Translation, the text says, yes, this is Paul. He says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counted it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ. Paul said, I have counted everything that I have accomplished in my life as useless and worthless. And I've done it for one reason. That my relationship with Christ might become stronger. If we're going to have a relationship with Christ, whereby it becomes an intimate relationship, a close relationship with him, then he has to become priority. What does that simply mean? It simply means that he has to become at the top of the list. He has to be a part of my everyday routine. It's like I brush my teeth every day. I should talk to Jesus every day. Just like I bathe every day, I should say something to Jesus every day. Just like I put food in my physical body, I should eat spiritual food every day. I shouldn't go a day without scripture. I don't go a day without a bagel. I shouldn't go a day without scripture. I don't go a day without uh, a, a donut. I should not go a day without scripture. I don't go a day without a cup of coffee. Well, I don't go a day without a cup of coffee. You might. I don't go a day without scripture. Amen, somebody. I forgot to read my word. Did you forget to eat? No, I, 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 I had me a burger. Then you should have had your bowl of Proverbs. Hallelujah, somebody. Yeah. Not only must you make God a priority, you have to steal yourself. Psalms 46 verse 10, the text says, be still and know that I am God. Some of us are too busy. You know, if they had medication for ADD back in the 60s, they would have put me on it.
attention, attention deficit disorder. That wasn't a thing back in the 60s. But I promise you, if it was, I would have been one of the ones that they would be like, come on, take this pill. Because my teachers was constantly telling me, boy, sit down. Douglas, get over here. Douglas, be still. Because I was constantly moving. Couldn't be still. My sister-in-law, is she up in here? Bless her so I love her. She don't know I know this. But she asked my wife one time, she said, does Doug have nervous energy? <laughs> Her point was, he's always moving. He never sat still. And it was the same thing when I came to know the Lord. The Lord had to teach me how to be still. I was not accustomed to being still. I was not accustomed of doing nothing. I was not accustomed of riding in the car without the music playing or a teaching being played. I was not accustomed of sitting still and listening to nothing but the Holy Spirit. I had to train myself to be still in the presence of the Lord. I had to teach myself how to remove myself from the kids and from the wife and from the television and from the cell phone and from all this stuff that I thought I needed to get done at that time and go into my office and shut the door, close the blinds, set myself in my chair and do nothing. Just be still. No interruptions. I had to tell myself, no, you don't have to use the bathroom right now. No, you don't have to get a glass of water right now. It's amazing when you're trying to be still in the presence of the Lord, your flesh be like, you got to use the bathroom. You hungry. Don't you need some, something to drink? No, I need to be still. He says, be still and know that I am God. That is a discipline that must be developed in the life of a believer where you intentionally become still, quiet in the presence of God. Say nothing, do nothing, see nothing. Because it's in that moment when you hear that still small voice ministering to you, talking to you, giving you direction and understanding of what God wants you to know and what God wants you to do. Be still in the presence of God. Some of us are just too busy and you'll never be able to know God like you want to until you're able to fellowship with him like you need to. Come and give him a praise. And the third thing is if we're going to know God a little better than what we know him now, we have to make the decision to know God. We have to make a conscious decision that says, I'm going to know my God. I'm not just going to church him. 
I'm not just going to shout at him. I am going to know him. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 21 the Living Bible translation the text says some of these people have missed the most important thing in life. They don't know God. One of the most important things you can do right now as a Christian is to know your God. It's good to know the word, but you need to know your God. It's good to pray, but you need to know your God. You need to know him. Know him for yourself. You know, you, there's, there's, there's people who they know football stats, basketball stats, baseball stats. You can ask them uh, about uh, this person, this quarterback, and they give you all the stats. You can ask them about this particular uh, basketball player, and they can tell you what college you went to, went to and uh, what teams they played on, and they can tell you how many points they made for the season. They can tell you everything about that player. Everything. You got some folks who know everything about the Atlanta Housewives. <laughs> who's on the show? Who's getting married? Who's getting divorced? They know everything about Atlanta Housewives. You know people, or you have people who know everything about social media and what's going on out there in social media. I wonder if if we could pray and spend as much time with God as we do texting and doing social media, I wonder just how well we would know God if we put that much energy into knowing him like we do social media. Oh yeah, we would know him, wouldn't we? Taxi, we would know him, wouldn't we? Jesus, Talking to the church, the Laodiceans. He says, I know you. I know your works. He says, I know you. The problem is, you don't know you, and you don't know me. He says, but I'm knocking at the door of your life, begging for an opportunity to know you. I'm knocking. I'm knocking at the door of the church. And I'm knocking at the door of your heart. He says, and if you let me in, I will come into your life. And we will have a personal relationship that will change your life. No better scripture than 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 explains it. The New Living Translation, it says this. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for a living, godly life. We have received all this by coming to know him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Now notice what he says. He says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need. I know God has given us everything we need. He says, for living a godly life, 
everything. And he said, we have received it all by coming to know him. What he's saying in this verse is that once we come to the place where we know God, where we have a relationship with God, where we fellowship with God, he says once we come to that place, then everything we need to live an empowered, godly life will be in our possession. How is that possible? It's possible because when you have him, you have all that you need. When you have Jesus, you have all that you need. Jesus is the healer. Jesus is the provider. Jesus is the deliverer. Jesus is the way maker. Jesus is the one that opens the door. When we have him, we have all that we need. But knowing him has to be intentional. You can't know him just on a Sunday because that's part time. What we're doing right here is part time. We won't, we won't do this again until next Sunday. You can't know someone on a part time basis. A relationship takes work, it takes effort, it's intentional, but it's rewarding if you put in the work. <laughs> Father, we bless you this morning. Father, we come with open hearts. Open minds. Ready to engage you and to know you on a whole different level. Father, as you knock at the door of our hearts, Father, we say yes. We say come in. Come into our hearts, come into our lives. That we might know you on a more personal, intimate level. Father, just like that is your desire. Lord, we make it our desire. We want to know you. We want to fellowship with you. We want to know this God that we worship. Father, we ask this morning that you would assist us in this relationship with you. Father, you said in your word that if we draw nigh to you, that you will draw nigh to us. And so, Father, as we make a life-changing decision, decision to run towards you, Father, we open our heart as you run towards us. 
Allow us to know you on a whole different level. Allow us to hear your voice on a whole different frequency. Allow us to know you this year in a way that is more intimate than it was last year. Father, we're hungry for you. Just like David when he says, as a deer pants for water, he pants for you. Father, we are hungry for you. We strive to know you. Help us to know and to understand you on a deeper level. Father, I pray that you remove the distractions out of our way. That you will shut doors that need to be shut. That you will open doors that need to open. That you remove folks out of our lives that are hindering us from seeing you. That you bring folks into our lives that can help us see you. Father, you know us. You know our situations. You know our circumstances. You know us on an individual basis. You know what we need to do. Father, we solicit your assistance and your help. That our relationship with you will go to a greater dimension. We embrace the ministering gift of the Holy Spirit who is our paraclete, our helper. That he will help us along the way. Help us to be sensitive to your presence, sensitive to your voice. Sensitive to your guidance and your direction. Father, we we want to know you. And we thank you this morning for what you would do in our own individual lives to assist us in this personal relationship with you. Father, we thank you. <laughs> what you should do and by faith we know it's done and we thank you for this in Jesus name we pray amen come on give him a love offering somebody come on give him a love offering he's worthy he's worthy Hallelujah. Is there anyone here this morning who will say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ. I want Jesus Christ to come into my life and I want you to pray with me. If you're here this morning or watching my social media, and you would like to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, Pastor, I want you to pray with me. I want you to simply repeat this prayer after me. In fact, I'm going to ask everyone to repeat it after me. And by way of social media, if you want Christ in your life, just repeat this prayer. A very simple prayer, but it's a powerful prayer that will change your life. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask that you forgive me of all of my sins. I truly believe that Jesus Christ is your son who suffered on the cross and died. But on the third day, he was raised from the dead. And he's now seated at your right hand.
praying for me that I might have life and have it more abundantly. Father, I'm asking for Jesus Christ to come into my life, to come into my heart, and to be my personal Lord and Savior. Now, Father, by faith, I believe that I am saved. Father, by faith, I believe that my name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And Father, I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Come on, give God a God bless you. Listen, if you pray this prayer for the first time this morning, wave at me so we can get some information to you this morning. If you pray this prayer for the first time, you've given your life to Christ, wave at us so we can get some information with you to you this morning. Anyone? By way of social media, if you pray this prayer for the first time, there's some information on the screen. Contact us. We want to know about you giving your life to Christ. We have some information for you. Amen.